Hey, what is up, everyone? Chris Manning here from the Locked on Kev's podcast with my co-host, Evan Damerl. On today's show, we are going to start off by previewing Cavs Sixers. We're going to look ahead to Sunday's Cavs Raptor showdown and at the end talk a little bit about the latest LeBron James Cavs nugget and then not talk about that again until he is in Cleveland again in like 18 days. That is all coming up today on Locked on Cavs, your daily Cleveland Cavaliers podcast. <laughs> You are Locked On Cavs, your daily Cleveland Cavaliers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. First off, I want to remind you and thank you for making Locked On Cavs your first listen every single day. Remember, we are free and available on all platforms and wherever you get your podcasts and obviously includes our YouTube channel. Also, if you're just joining us for the first time, I'm Chris Manning. I cover the Cavs and the league at large for places like Diamond Up Rocks, Fear the Sword, and others. My co-host, Evan Damerl, covers the Cavs primarily for Facebook's Right Down to Euclid, writes for Fear the Sword, and places like Play Ohio. Evan, we're here at the end of the week. How are you doing? I'm good, man. You know, I was going to say... Uh, you you know, yo, what up? My name is Evan. I'm not a professional podcaster. I'm just doing this shit so my racks go faster, grow faster. But thank you for that intro. I'm good. It's a good. Um, oh. I'm gonna don't tell me because I know I can hear that bar that you're riffing on from the Odd Future, like ten minute posse cut in my head. And it's I'm, moldy. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm going to. From, I'm. It's from Jasper. It's from J- Jasper. Yes, Jasper. There you go. Shouts to my use. My brain full of useful information. But. That's good. Have Jack a- Jack has his own Jasper. I'm good, man. How are you though? Ja- wait, ja- wait, Jasper. Jasper's a member of Jackass now. Yes. Holy hell! This is this is news to me. Tyler and um, Taco were in the movie too, just for a brief second. So is Eric Andre. This is very important to my specific niche. Uh, <laughs> but enough about that. Evan, the Cavs played the 76ers. On Friday, uh, on this show, we are going to cover Cavs Sixers. We are going to cover Cavs Raptors, which takes place Sunday. Both of those games will take place before we do an episode. Um, I haven't talked about it yet, but I might just drop like a 10-minute. Here's what happened in the Sixers game. Think Saturday morning. Evan, are you cool with that? Can I do that? Are you okay with that? Yeah, you have my consent to do that. You, you, cool. It's cool. Thank you for asking me live on the show. It's like yeah. when you run guests by me, I'm like, I don't care. Look, I'm just, I'm just about. Cinder- well, I have a golden list that we will not say of who cannot come on the show, or else I will not be there if they're there. I mean, Marissa there's... McNeese, you know what you did. Anywho, uh, this game, Evan, I think will be real interesting. We don't. I, I'm going to check as we're recording. I don't think we have a betting line yet, but I would suspect the 76ers are going to be favorites. I have a lot of questions uh, about this. I mostly revolved, uh, revolved around James Harden. Um, I did some reading today, watched some tape. You know, thought about this a little bit. But uh, I want to start with you. What do you What are you expecting out of out of Cavs Sixers? Um, see, this is a bit of a tough question because I. I... I, I figured the Sixers would be obviously better with James Harden on the floor because they just didn't have Ben Simmons outright. He compliments Joel Embiid very well. I think the grift that those two have hunting fouls is just perfect for one another. Um, the Sixers are probably going to be one of the most frustrating games for Cavs fans to watch. If they really hate the officials after that game on Wednesday night, they're really going to hate the officials after Friday night against Philly, me thinks. But this is going to be an interesting gut check game for the Cavs because they got humiliated by the Hornets. Let's be frank. Like they kind of got back into it and they just got the doors blown off them again. And JB Bickerstaff got tossed. Darius Garland calls the team soft. Jared Allen says that they just aren't playing with the same fire and intensity. Isaac Okoro expressed similar sentiments during a shoot around. You have to wonder how this Cavs team is going to respond. And that's what I'm going to be really looking at on the Cleveland side of things. Like my expectations are low. I think they're probably going to lose to Philly if I had to guess, just because hostile crowd, hostile environment. It's tough to go get up against the MVP and Joel Embiid, the likely MVP. James Harden is juicing this team like I thought it would. Like this is going to be a tough game for the Cavs, but I want to see how they handle that adversity and how they come out on top. Like. Win or lose, I'm more focused on how this Cav, what this Cavs team's disposition is going forward. So I maybe don't have to be as concerned like this team's falling apart at the seams. Yeah, so the Cavs are, according to our friends at Bet Online, seven point underdogs 
um, going into Philadelphia. And, you know, they're, they're on the road to make sense of their the underdog, but that's a, a sizable. But I, I think, Evan, that this whole weekend for me, and starting with this Philly game, there's some tactical stuff I think we should we should touch on. But mm-hmm. I, I want to th- – Oh, we will. But... Yeah, but, but, but all week, you, you already said it, J.B. Bickerstaff, Darius Garland, Jared Allen, Isaac Okoro, like every single Cavs person that has spoken to the media this week has said, we need to p- get back to playing gritty. We need to get back to the scrap. We need to get back to whatever word they're using to describe playing effort, disciplined basketball. Um, Jamie Bickerstaff, like we, we used a different clip, but he basically outlined like three things they're doing wrong, and it all comes back to execution and discipline right now. And those were hallmarks of this team's success that has gotten away from them of late. And Philly tactically is injuring test for that. Philly has been really good since they got James Harden. Harden is also doing some off-ball screening. He is playing decoy within the offense when Embiid is on the floor. This is not Rockets hard and just thrown into Philly. He looks really good. He looks motivated. That hammy that he had injured coming over from Brooklyn looks pretty good. This team is a little more dangerous than the team that beat the Cavs not that long ago. And look, there's there's stuff we can take from that last game. I think I'm curious to see how the Cavs adjust their uh, defensive strategy against Joel Embiid, considering how well he played against Jared Allen in that game. But the Harden stuff is where this really starts. And I'm, I'm because this is on the fly, because this is so very early in that process, because the Cavs are in this weird spot, because this is not a playoff series where you get a couple of days to game plan over one specific guy. I'll be really curious to see how the Cavs decide to approach this. And, and let's see what they look like coming out of the gates on in, in the first quarter and in the first half. Yeah, I'm curious to see actually how the game plan in general, because the Cavs, weirdly enough, this will be the second time of four times they play Philadelphia this season. They normally at Eastern Conference teams, they don't play this each other or start playing each other this late into the year. They start wrapping up series at this point. JB kind of had an interesting point. The first time they played them, they really got their asses kicked after Joel Embiid had like an incredible triple double, all their worldly performance and really took Jared Allen to uh, the cleaners in that one. But Bickerstaff said that they didn't really have much to scout on because Philly made all those trades in the Ben Simmons act or the James Harden acquisition involving Ben Simmons, Seth Curry and Andre Drummond. So like it, it changed their overall scouting report. So I feel like they have a decent sample size to work with now. So there's a little bit less unknowns and less variables. And you can kind of see the ebbs and flows of how Harden and MB play with one another and just kind of how maybe they can exploit certain matchups. Because again, the first time the Cavs played the Bucks when they were fully healthy, Drew Holiday ate Darius Garland's lunch and then some probably took his lunch for the rest of the week at that point. But the Cavs made adjustments intelligently the next time they played a fully health Bucks squad to more or less force Drew Holiday off Darius Garland more often than not. So Garland had the space to operate and create while Garland was still having back issues. So I think the Cavs will make adjustments. I just wonder if they have the mentality and tenacity to kind of meet the challenge that's ahead of them. Yes. Uh, but I'm going to, before we're going to break, I want to pitch you um, a, what I would say, I, if, if Philly starts as expected, Maxi Harden, Thibel, Harris, and Bede. May I suggest this formation just based on the personnel because of the Harden change like, and, and et cetera. Okay. I would say, I would look to see Garland defends Maxi. I would, I would like to see Mobley on Thibel. I would like to see Markkinen on Harris. I would like to see Allen on Embiid and Okor on Harden. I like the Mobley on Thibel aspect. The Cavs tried that the first time they played, and it worked. It really worked because Mobley can play a bit of a free safety role. He can provide a lot of help coverage and cover up some of the mismatches that Philly presents. I, just the Harden factor really changes a lot of things. I feel like he could blow this up, too. Well, Okoro has to defend him, and um, I'll yeah. below, uh, a friend of the program, Jackson Frank, wrote a really good piece about Maxi really thriving in this Harden world over at Liberty Ballers. And, like, Darius is going to have to – like, Darius isn't – you know, Darius, this is uh, someone he worked out with. Mm-hmm. These guys know each other. Like, before Tyrese Maxey was drafted, these two guys were playing against each other all summer. Like, they're, they're both with the same agency, you know, for yeah. Yeah, they're close. Like, well, I mean, they, at least they know each other. I, I can't speak to, like, their relationship, but they at least, like, know each other, right? Like, there's some familiarity there, but, like, it's going to be a test for for Darius to, to handle some of the stuff Maxey's going to gonna throw at him. He needs to hold up – defensively and i and look i, I also want to see how that if mobley and allen's doubles on Embiid can be tighter than they were they were not particularly good solid doubles that made that pressured and beat in the last game those have to be better this time mm-hmm. around that's to me perhaps that and the effort are like the two things i really really want to see in this one Evan, after the break we're going to move on to the raptors game uh which we'll we'll break down in detail on monday's show but 
Uh, we will, again, get, dive into some of the stuff with the, the Raptors, some of the situations and implications on the playoffs. And we kind of go forward to that. But you first are going to tell everyone about our friends at Bet Online. You're absolutely correct. Football might be over the season, but basketball is in full sp- steam for pro and college hoops with the playoffs for the NBA in March Madness looming. From all the latest odds, totals, player performances, props to where the next fired coach is going to land, BetOnline.net is the number one spot for all your favorite sports betting needs. BetOnline remains the best spot for all your sports scores, podcasts, and news this season. And it's not just basketball. BetOnline.net is your source for hockey, boxing, UFC odds, right down to Olympic coverage, and even more information. Head to their website today or use your mobile device to learn about the trends and action. Bet online, where the game starts. All right, we are back here on the Lockdown Cavs podcast. I'm Chris Manning. That is Evan Damro. Evan, what up? Cavs, let's look at Cavs Raptors. No uh, odds there yet because this game is a couple of days away. As we are recording this, we should know that the Raptors are playing the Detroit Pistons uh, without Fred Van Vliet, who is who was listed as questionable, but then was ruled out for this game. Um, OG and Anubi. With what? Uh, I, I think like a, some kind of like a thing. But OG and Anubi, I will look up for sure. But OG and Anubi um, is hurt and won't play in this game. He will not play on Sunday either with due to a fracture in his ring finger. Um, the, the Raptors are kind of interesting because they're similar to the Cavs in terms of they don't play like a super deep rotation. Mm-hmm. But they play really small. This is a team that plays doesn't play the kind of bigs that the Cavs have, right? Like, they they don't mm-hmm. have a Jared Allen or an Evan Mobley size-wise. They have six, eight guys who can switch and play really, really hard. This will be a really interesting stylistic matchup. Um, OG not playing in this game does certainly change some of what they do defensively. Um, I, I do want to see just how these two teams match up. It should be weird. It should be fun, and I'm, I'm kind of excited to see it. Yeah, I am interested to see it as well. I think the OG factor is – an interesting development for the Cavs. I wonder if Fred Van Vliet's availability. I was trying to pull up the injury report while you're talking, but my phone wasn't cooperating with me. But I'll, I'll look it up and and uh, we'll we'll I'll bring it because <clears throat> that certainly could be an X factor as well. But I'm sure if people are watching on YouTube while you're talking, so let me raise my eyebrows. I didn't know Detroit was looking to sweep Toronto in the season series. So Wayne, if the Wayne Casey is like eight and three against against the Raptors, which is kind of funny. That is something to take into consideration. So we are recording this before the game, but. If Detroit does end up sweeping Toronto in the season series, that is pretty beneficial for the Cavs just in terms of playoff jockeying because, again, Justin Rowan pointed this out to me. The Cavs currently have a tiebreaker over Toronto. I didn't know that off the top of my head, but like record-wise, there's a good chance Cleveland and Toronto could be tied heading into Sunday's primetime game on ESPN, which is a little bit of a bummer now that you think about it. But if the Cavs lose that, they are firmly in the – Why is that a bummer? Because the Cavs have stunk lately. If you want them on ESPN, you want them to look proper. I just I want some stakes. I, I'm I just want some stakes. I want some some drama is what I'm looking for. If you want some stakes, go to Marble Room. You have a gift card. I no, buddy. I use that already. That that is that's impressive because I know how much that gift card was. And no, that didn't even cover the bill, bro. That was that was it. It was nice, but it wasn't. You know. Shouts to Bill Bar. But anyways, um. Depending on if Fred Van Vliet's available, this could be a huge factor for Cleveland as well because the point I was trying to get to was if Cleveland loses that, they are firmly in the play-in race and not the playoff race in Toronto, and I think Boston would likely leapfrog them as well. And like That's where things get really, really, really tight. And if you're the Cavs, you want to win some of these games now so that you're not kind of panicking and stressing to get to the playoffs and avoid the play-in altogether because... I think, like I talked about, it's kind of a bummer that they kind of stunk lately, and that's why they're and they're going to be at ESPN heading into that. They could always change as well. Maybe the bright lights just really cause the Cavs to shine. But I think it would stink even harder if the Cavs ended in the play-in and they lose, and we don't get to watch them play a seven-game series. Like I think at this point, I've invested enough emotionally in the season and just like professionally in this season that I want to see them succeed. And just get to that point where I can say, yeah, they made the playoffs without LeBron. That's pretty freaking cool. Well, I, I think just go, I think from the development standpoint, I think a seven game series. Oh, that, that pushes, too. Well, I, I think that just like pushes them. I think that is really good for their their development. Um, I, I think that would just be um, really interesting to kind of to kind of see some of that. The, the other thing interesting to me about this weekend, Evan, is the Cavs and the Raptors. Both like so, 
Toronto plays Thursday, they play Friday, and then they play Sunday. The Cavs are off Thursday, they just played Wednesday, um, and then obviously these two teams play Sunday. The difference is the Cavs play Philly Friday, and then they play Toronto Sunday. That's two good teams. And they just played another team that's going to be in the playoffs slash playing in, in Charlotte. <laughs> the Raptors are playing Detroit, who on paper is bad, but as you lose to, have, they've lost to. Then they play Orlando, and then they play the Cavs. So, like, theoretically, the Cavs kind of need one of these bad teams to beat Toronto and, and do them a little bit of a favor here. Um, after the Pistons game, Toronto will have played 62 games. That is the same number as the Cavs. Uh this, these are teams that are sort of going head to head at a really key point in the season. The Cavs are a little bit ahead. If they if they beat Detroit, uh, they will be one game back of the Cavs, and then we'll see what happens Friday. That could impact this as well. If one win, one's lose. That's like this could get this is going to be tight on Sunday. It could be a little more stretched out if things break Cleveland's way in terms of who Toronto can or cannot beat. But mm-hmm. it, it's, it, this is, game's going to have impact, and I think that to me is more fun than anything, that we have impactful basketball in March, and we're not doing, like, draft stuff now, which is always very hard to do. But, Evan, before we go into break, I want to ask you this. Okay. What, teams, what teams overall in the Eastern Conference right now do you feel are the actual, like, cream of the crop in the conference? We, we've touched on this a little bit this year, but if you were going to pick two or three teams that you say are the actual best of the best in the East right now, who are those teams, and then how – where, what tier would you put the Cavs in? Uh, Philly, Miami, and Milwaukee are in the top tier for me, uh, just because I really do think Harden and Bede are that high. Brooklyn, depending on whether or not Ben Simmons is available, and just if they can make a late season push, they could be in like that tier three, tier two. That's kind of where I put the Cavs right now. Just Brooklyn's unfortunately not healthy for them, unfortunately for them, and Kyrie Irving, the vaccine mandate in. New York is just a is a can of worms in itself. I think the Cavs are a tier two, tier three team, or I firmly maintain the stance where they could be at their best, like a second round exit, like a hard second round exit. They could maybe be last year's Hawks, where they somehow sneak into these finals. They draw enough teams and catch them off guard by enough. But I just don't think if you put them in a seven game series against Miami. Eric Spolster is probably going to coach circles around J.D. Bickerstaff, and defensively they're going to clamp down a lot of key pieces for the Cavs. Milwaukee, similar issues in itself. I think the seven-game series is just a different beast altogether than regular season. But that's what kind of where I put the Cavs at. How about you? I go Tier 1 or the same three teams you said, Philly, um, Milwaukee, and Miami in some order. I, I'm putting Brooklyn in their own like second tier just because like they're the biggest wild card in all of this. Like Kevin Durant is not back. He's going to – play for Brooklyn he's playing for Brooklyn on Thursday um Mm -hmm. we'll see if Kyrie Irving uh the the vaccine stuff in New York changes that would be a very big deal for them obviously we'll see what happens with Ben Simmons um so I'm putting them in their tier two with just like a big like shrug emoji next to it and I kind of think every other team in the east is like sort of um you you could convince me of a lot of different things I think the Cavs are like have proven based on their quality this year to be like above Atlanta, um, I think overall an aggregate above Charlotte. Some of these teams that are like a little below them, I think there's it's just like the top, there's like a clear top of the East, and then you could convince mm-hmm. me of a lot of different things below them. And like styles can make difference of it. You know, it could be who gets hottest going to the playoffs, who gets the right seating. I mean, certainly Boston has played really, really well of late, and they're oh, making yeah. a big push. Like th- there's a lot to be said um, <laughs> about what's going on here and, and how competitive this is. And it's fun. I, 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 I agree. It is very fun. Like, you, like I mean, if the season ended today, it'd be, we'd be getting Cavs uh, bucks in round one. Which would be fun to watch Evan Mobley go toe to toe with Giannis for a seven game series. Yeah. And like, and it, there's just a lot of stuff. And again, that is much more advanced than like where they were last year. That is, that is progress. It is also just like, I want to see something. Um, I, I want to see how I I want I I think one of the I just want to see how the Cavs they react to the pressure and stuff they're seeing they're facing now, and then I just want to see the the pressure they will feel in the playoffs. I think that is really like the the meat of what what's on the rest of the season for me. And well. also, yeah. friend of the pod Martin Rickman really smartly told us once that it's also not just this season; it's how they look next year too. Like this is invaluable experience. I want to see how you build upon this as well. Like you, you have an established big three, flesh this out, grow it out. We'll do everything from there, but that's always obviously something we can worry about down the line too. Yeah. That's, I think that's something, um, you know, I, this is one of those years I hope we get, uh, 
Chris Manning, hit cross off on your checklist, advocates for media availability. I would like exit interviews for once in my in my time covering this team. I don't think they've ever had them. And I think just have impromptu press conferences. It is what it is. Zoom it COVID makes it tricky. But Chris, Throw let's talk about let's go. What? Put them on Zoom. It's not a big deal. Anyway, we're gonna tell everyone about Bill Bar after the break. We are going to talk about uh the today sponsor. Yeah, the little LeBron nugget, but first Bill Bar. This Evan is the time of year that everyone gives up on New Year's resolutions, but you know what can help you stick to your New Year's resolutions? It's Bill Bar. Bill Bars are the best tasting protein bar on the market. They're covered in hundred percent real chocolate, including their great puffs. They're low calorie, high protein protein bars. These are better than a candy bar and they're healthy for you. Candy bar, for instance, has 240 calories, 30 grams of sugar, and dozens of net carbs. A built bar, most of them contain 130 calories, 4 grams of sugar, 4 grams of net carbs, and 17 grams of protein. There's great flavors, mint brownie, coconut, coconut almond, and more. They have a peanut butter one out right now. I mean, who doesn't love peanut butter? At built bar, they're all about the taste. They're going to make it taste delicious first and then figure out how to make it healthy. And I don't know how, but they pull it off every time. So order some today. Go to Built.com. Use the promo code LOCK15 and get 15% off your order. Again, use the promo code LOCK15 for 15% off at Built.com. All right, last segment of the day. Chris Manning, Evan Damerel here. Evan, here's what Jake Fisher from Bleacher Report wrote earlier this week. Um, I'll put the link to this in the show notes as well below. Uh, in regards to LeBron James, and this is a, a I'm going to read directly from this piece. "Quote: It doesn't. It does seem that Cleveland's door isn't as isn't open as widely as James and as and others may have believed. Cavaliers personnel have taken great pride in their burgeoning playoff contender, set to make the postseason for the first time without James since 1998. For any reading to occur, Cleveland appears keen on simply adding veteran talent like James. There's no one like James, but that's funny. Into the roster." They've assembled it's quite, quite a big there. Yeah, it's funny. Uh, rather than co-piloting personal decisions with superstar, end quote. Uh, again, a link to this in the show notes. Evan, what do you make of this? What do you make of just this LeBron flirting? I, I, I understand that this won't be fun for everyone to talk about. I, I, I want us to put a pin in this and then come back to it when we absolutely need to. But uh, what do you? So what we do you haven't make really, we haven't really talked about it much. I think we both just agreed that this is LeBron using the media's a bludgeon on the Lakers front office to say, hey, you guys fucked up. You didn't make any moves to the trade deadline. You didn't go get John Wall. Well, and then, well, then he did come out and say, like, I envision myself being the purple and gold. Like, there, he did sort of be like, yeah, like, I'm probably going to be a Lakers. LeBron is, LeBron is both sidesing it like Kevin Durant would, and Durant is just so proud right now. But um, – But what do you make – what do you I, make of this logic that we're uh, – What I make of this logic, it's – an interest, not a surprising development. I think the Cavs really do take a lot of pride. Jared Allen really said it during his All Star meet availability. That's like, yeah, I take a lot of pride personally that we're the first team without LeBron in Cavs history since like '98. Which, to preface, Chris Manning and I would have been like four or five years old at that point um, during that season. So just to age ourselves a little bit. So it's, it's been a while since the Cavs have not or have made the playoffs without LeBron on the roster, Avi, but like Jared Allen takes a lot of pride in it. I think JV Bickerstaff, if you asked him once they finally get there, he'd probably say he takes a lot of pride of it, but he's a very like in the moment coach. Whenever you ask him those questions, he's never really fixed it in the playoffs. He's just fixed it on who they have to play next, which is smart. Uh, well, same goes for a lot of the guys, I think, but if you like ask them heart to heart, like, yeah, they take a lot of pride in the fact that they, want to do this martin rickman shared it with us too when we had him on the show when he was talking about his covers piece on darius that like something that didn't make it off the cutting room floor is the fact that darius kind of talked about the fact that like they're really proud of the fact that we make the playoffs without lebron so it doesn't surprise me i think i think the dig is funny where they said um adding veteran talent like lebron because if you can get a veteran like lebron for what you have available resources wise like financially that's that's a huge win <laughs> at the end of the day but let's be frank if somehow some way the Cavs could get LeBron James to come back I think they'd make it happen because there has been a void at small forward ever since he left I know Chetty Osmond's tried his best Lawyer Markin is not a three by nature but he's trying his best but if you put LeBron on this roster they would be in the catbird seat to really make some noise I think but I also just think it's funny. I wonder if it's maybe just some 
repressed memories or like fears from an abusive relationship or like, you know, there's the association of LeBron like running the show and it's Le GM in Cleveland. But at the same time, I just think it's funny that it's like publicly known that like if LeBron were to come back, he wouldn't be a factor in personnel decisions. He would just be a veteran supporting like Garland, Mobley and Allen. Well, number one, I don't believe that he wouldn't have any say. Like he's LeBron James. He's getting, yeah. you know, um, he is, he is a franchise player, no matter how you put it. He's, here, here's what I, I, I think I, the tea leaves on this is I would sort of read them. The Cavs are saying, Hey, we are actually the attract. Like we are already is something assembled for you now. And in, in this, sense. I think that's what this is. I don't think it is. I'm sure there's a sense of pride. I'm sure there's a sense of all of that. But if they're looking at adding a, a player, it is. I think like we, it is very clear that the, the plan going forward here is how do we best support Evan Mobley? How do we best support Darius Garland? How do we best support Jared Allen? Those are the questions you're asking. And I think if it is, it this isn't 2014 again. The Cavs have done the thing that they needed to do post LeBron, which was like develop a team that has young talent that is worth a damn and like get on the right track and actually win basketball games without LeBron James on their roster. That is what they've done. And if he if if the reunion tour comes, if the retirement LeBron thing comes, if he does it to come back again, it, it will have some of his fingerprints on it because it is impossible to do that with like it is impossible to have LeBron. someone who is as ego and legacy obsessed as LeBron James will have some input. He, he, he's the greatest of all time. He does like, yeah. He, Deserves he deserves that, that luxury he, too. He deserves that stuff, but like he, he's I, not going to get the Michael Jordan treatment like he did at the end of his time with the Bulls. It's going to be, but it will just look a little differently. Like I, I think when he came back in 2014, he shaped the organization. I, I think things like, like I, I don't, I think it would function a little differently. And frankly, some of it is just because of the talent. Some of this is because. This would be an older LeBron. This isn't LeBron in his prime who can still do what he did in that four-year run and, and be the best player in the league for my money in that stretch. This would be LeBron that is still very, very good, but is helping ascending talent and helping guide them and doing LeBron stuff and, and providing help in that way. It would just it would look different. And I think the structure of the relationship would be different. And I think all of this just sort of tracks. But and I, and I do just frankly believe if you're Kobe Altman who was around for that LeBron era, if you're Gansey who was around, if you're the ownership who was around, all that stuff. If all these people that have that have been around, and like the coach, like there are some people, there are some new faces here, right? Like JV Baker staff was not around for that. Um, a lot of the play, like Kevin Love, is like the the, the holdover. You know, like the, there's not a ton of things that have carried over era to era. But the people that are still around and have been here this whole time, they probably do feel a sense of pride that I I think is a pretty human thing to feel if you're if you're going for this so I, I i again i well i'm we're gonna talk i'm sure like when he comes back to town there will be another uh news cycle about this we'll see what he has to say i'm curious to see like if he gets asked about mobley and stuff directly and that and that kind of thing and and we'll see where the lakers are at and, and stuff like that and we'll, we'll talk about that maybe we'll do something um with with a lakers show and just talk to them about the the, the lebron vibes and and just kind of dive into that meta-ness as we're getting it's messy the over there I didn't know they were 27-34. I've been quietly tracking the record every now and then. Holy moly, they're bad. Yeah. Uh, not, not Actually, I have a fun stat. Okay. Um, do you have any final thoughts before I... No, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of... I'm tapped out. Of, I uh, just need some more water. Okay. So, did you know that the Sacramento Kings have not had a win since Rick Adelman? was the head coach in eight years the kings had a winning record with rick ottoman as head coach he last coached the team during the 05 06 season that ineptitude is how did you but how did you pivot to a king stat is my question i just thought about that today we were talking about king james i just thought about them like that's fascinating chris would appreciate that statistic Rick Adelman, also the coach of the the architect of the offense that made kevin love into an all nba player helped ascend yeah. kevin love into an all nba player in, in minnesota also, the defensive schemes um, Rick Adelman had a place in is what J.B. Biggerstaff sometimes uses with Evan Mobley, so that's fun, too. Rick Adelman and also um, during the prime KG Timberwolves sets, that's what he ran a lot, too. So, Chris, yep. It's, it's all connected, baby. Kevin Garnett, LeBron, the Sacramento Kings, it's all connected. Sure. LeBron did play his first game in Sacramento. So, anyway. But there you go. Full circle.
I stayed up way too late to watch that game, and very weird that his first game was in Sacramento. Anyway, I digress. That is going to be it for this episode of Lockdown Cavs. Here's what we're going to do. Uh, we're gonna. I will be back Saturday morning. I'm just going to riff on Cavs Sixers for like 10 minutes, give you some bonus Lockdown Cavs for Saturday because that's kind of an important game. Um, we'll probably rerun that in the show on Monday just to, just to save ourselves a little bit of work. But uh, just – that that's coming. You're gonna get some stuff on Saturday to help you. If you want a little riff on that game, um, I'm gonna give you some some content for that one. But if you want to get a second listen today, may I suggest Locked On Hawks? Brad Roland. Just want to plug my guy Brad. He launches a YouTube channel. Go subscribe to his. Help him get to a thousand, and check out Locked On Bets as well. I'm Chris. That's Evan. We'll be back on Monday. We're looking back at the weekend and giving you an update on where the Cavs are standing wise after a very important weekend of basketball. Until then, be well, be safe, be healthy, and uh, drink some water. Hydrate. Hydration. It's key.